Hello and welcome to Secrets of the Jam Session. In this one we're going to look at how musicians play together without having the book, having a song sheet, even knowing the song. If you've been to a ukulele festival and you've maybe seen the performers in the bar later on just playing and wondered how do they know all of those songs? How are they all playing together without getting their folder of songs or their iPad out? You might also have seen acts invite other acts to join them on stage and wondered how much rehearsal went into that. And it's actually a lot less than you would imagine. Jamming, in its truest sense, is musicians just playing off each other, reacting to each other, anticipating what people are going to do next. It's a really exciting, fulfilling thing to do. Rather than just all playing from the same sheet, when musicians jam, they are in the moment. They're deciding where the music goes right at that second. There's a fair amount of improvisation going on. And when you get to the end of a song, when you've jammed your way through it, it can be a really rewarding experience. But if you've never done it before, how do you even approach it? What is going on? So what I'm going to do in this video is take you through 12 steps, 12 things to think about and to practice to help you jam with others. The first thing is to listen. At a jam session, the musicians are very carefully listening to the musicians around them, particularly to the musician who is leading the jam, but to everybody else too. Because as people contribute things, if you can't listen to what they're doing, you can't react to it in your own playing. Just because you know a song, it doesn't mean the people who you're jamming with will play it in the same way as you. And if you just plough ahead and play your version of that song, while the other musicians are playing a different version, it's going to become pretty obvious that you aren't listening and reacting to them when you just keep bashing on the same chord even though it doesn't fit. Quite often, when musicians enter a jam session, they might not play for the first song or two. They're just getting a feel for it. They're listening to what's happening in the room. Who's playing? What instruments are there? Who's calling the songs? Are people taking it in turns to call songs? If somebody asks me, do I have a song? Just finding your way. Listening is a really underrated, under-practiced skill. And to jam, you've really got to get good at listening. Don't be afraid to ask questions like, what key are we going to play in? Because even if someone calls a song and you know it, it could be in a different key. And if you just say, what key? And they say, oh, F, you immediately have got a lot of the guesswork out of the way. You go, F, OK, I know the things that are likely to happen in F. I know the chords that are likely to come up in F. I've got a fighting chance of keeping up with this. When I first heard musicians jamming and tried to jam, all I could think was that either they all knew a lot of songs in all of the keys, all memorised, or that they had some kind of skill, some kind of ability like perfect pitch, where they could just hear that chord and go, I recognise that chord. Now, there are people that can do that, but most musicians are just recognising patterns. They're recognising things they've heard before in a different context and then they know how to make that pattern happen on their instrument. And you can make a start at doing that yourself in very, very simple ways. I bet you've all played C, F and G7. Loads and loads of songs with C, F and G7. Now, first of all, that's a good thing to know because if someone calls a three chord song in the key of C, they're likely to be your three chords. If it's a blues or a rock and roll tune or maybe a country tune, even if there's a fourth chord, you already know three of them. But what if they call it in a different key? Well, it's good to know that that pattern is called the one, the four and the five. And that's simply counting through the scale. So if I'm in C, C is 1, C, D, E, F is 4, and G is 5. And that 5 chord, the 5th step, 
is most likely played as a seventh chord. Now you don't have to sit there counting. If you've got a circle of fifths like this one, even if it's just a sticker on your case or something somewhere about you, I know someone that's got one tattooed on their leg, which is very useful, particularly in the summer when they've got shorts on, they can just have a little look. But I also know people that have them as a little sticker on here, it doesn't matter. But the point is, if you find the key and someone says we're in the key of A, you look at your circle of fifths, you find A, that's your one chord. Your four chord is the one anti-clockwise of it, D, and the one clockwise of it is your five chord, E, and that's most likely an E7. I've actually done a longer video on how to play the three chord trick, which is what this is often called, in lots of different keys, and I'll put a little link up to that in the corner of the screen now, and you can go and check that one out. Knowing these patterns is a way of immediately taking the panic out of a situation. If somebody calls a song, and, like we said before, you can always ask, you can say, is that one just a 12 bar blues? And they might go, yeah, yeah, just a 12 bar blues. Okay, what key is it in? It's in C, and you immediately know a 12 bar blues in C. Why do you know a 12 bar blues in C? Because it's such a common thing, you should learn it. Lots and lots of songs are a 12 bar pattern in C. Now there are little subtle variations, but here's a 12 bar in C. C. Two bars of C. Three bars of C. Four bars of C. Then we're on to the F for two bars. And back to the C for two bars. G7 for two bars, and a C for two bars, and we go round and round and round. What you'd have to do is listen out for the subtle variations. Sometimes we go to the F chord, the four chord, in bar two. So instead of C for the first line, it might go C, F, and then back to C, and C. And on the last line, when we played two bars of G7 and two bars of C, it might actually go one bar of G7, down to the F, and then down to the C. There might be a turnaround on the end as well. We'll talk about those in a moment. Other patterns that you might want to have under your fingers, and do try and have them under your fingers in a few different keys. You don't have to learn them in all 12 keys straight away, but if you can play in C and G, maybe A. Uh, if there are guitar players at the jam, learn to play in E because they might call a, a 12 bar blues in E. And I know that's a tricky one, but it's a good one if you're jamming with people who aren't just ukulele players. And just expand how many keys you can play them in gradually. And then you won't be caught out when someone calls a 12 bar blues and you go, yeah, I can play one of those. And they say it's in the key of F. And you go, oh, no, but I can't do it in F. That's a shame. I'll have to sit this one out. Another common pattern is almost the same as the three chord one. And this is something you'll find a lot. Many of these patterns are the same as other ones with a little tweak or one chord added. Take your C, F and G7 and put an A minor in there. And you can have C, A minor, F and G7, or maybe just a G. Mix up the order, and you can have C. Let's do a G this time. A minor, F. You're probably already starting to hear songs that you know use those patterns as you're strumming them. If you're not, keep strumming around them and see if anything springs to mind, or if anybody in your house starts to hum along or sing to them. And then you'll remember that song has that pattern. Learning the chords for that are really easy because if you've learnt your three chord trick, you only have one more chord to learn. And on your circle of fifths, that chord is right on the inside circle below the key you are in. So in C, it's an A minor. Finally, lots of songs take a trip anti-clockwise around the circle of fifths. So if you're jamming and people go C, E7, that should start to make you think, oh, is this going to be a trip around the circle of fifths? It could well be. It might go somewhere else, but we listen, and then it goes to an A7. And at that point we go, ah, I think 
a D7 might come next, and then a G7, and then we're back to our C. And that's those kind of songs, particularly from the jazz era, particularly from the 20s and 30s, things like Ain't She Sweet, Five Foot Two, uh, lots and lots of those songs. Please don't talk about me when I'm gone. That go around the circle of fifths. Don't just learn them in C. Move everything around the circle. If you start on G, then you've started one step clockwise from where you were before. So you'll jump to a chord one step clockwise from where you were before. So you go G, B7, but then the rest of this sequence is the same. We're on the E7, which goes to the A7, which goes to the D7, which goes back to the G. And you'll start to find those little patterns and recognize them. And if you know your circle of fifths, particularly moving anti-clockwise as a bunch of seventh chords, you'll be able to keep up with those patterns too. The key is, don't throw yourself in the deep end with a really complicated jazz song at your first jam session. Try and play along with records, for example. That's the best way to learn to jam initially, is to put music on, recorded music, and try and play along with it. You're not going to be embarrassed if you can't do it. You're not going to be worried about playing the same song 10 times in an attempt to get it, and it'll start to develop those skills. Plus, those skills are the same skills that you use to work out the chords for a song and write them down to, say, take to your ukulele club. So you'll be able to find the chords to a song without relying on looking it up on the internet. And as we know, quite often chords on the internet are not entirely accurate. Well, if you've developed your ear, you'll spot the chords that are wrong and you'll be able to correct them. If you're thinking about simple songs, how many times maybe in your ukulele club have you played the Mavericks dance the night away. Well, here's a chart for that song. Yep, it's two bars, repeated all the way through the song. One bar has one chord in it, the second bar has another chord. They are the one chord and the five chord, that five chord played as a seventh. So in C, it would be C, and clockwise on your circle of fifths is G, and we play it as a G7. repeat. That's the entire song. So if you know how to find the chord that goes with the key you're in in that one, the one that's one step clockwise played as a seventh, you can play that in any key at all. The key of F, F, C7. The key of G, G, D7. Sometimes songs are very, very simple. Learn to spot the signs. Quite often, chord changes are telling us what's about to happen. And they're great for the audience because even though the audience may not understand what's happening, they set up a feeling that gets the audience ready for something to happen. And that's very satisfying as a listener, but it's very useful in a jam session because you are getting a warning. That 12 bar blues we were doing before, we had four bars of C. What if in the last bar of C, it turned into a C7? Here's our C. Now at the moment, unless I know a 12 bar blues, that next chord is gonna come as a surprise. It's right out of the blue, and if I didn't know it was coming, I'm not gonna keep up. But, up on the last bar of C. I've turned it into a C7. That C7 has a tension that hopefully we can all hear that this one didn't have. The minute we get it, everyone goes, oh, we're off somewhere. Even if you didn't change to C7 and you carried on playing C, which would be fine, if you hear people around you going to a C7, you know that you're gonna change chord. And the odds are you're going to be going to the four chord, the one anti-clockwise of the chord you're currently playing. Doesn't matter what key you're in, if we've got a C chord and it turns into a C7, a fairly safe bet is an F next. 
It isn't always the case, but what we're doing here is reducing the odds, figuring out what's the most likely thing to go for, rather than just having a, a blind guess. Now, the minute you look up from reading a chart and reading the words, you'll start to notice, and if you see a jam session at a festival, just sit back and watch and see what other things the musicians are doing. They'll be using cues that are nothing to do with listening or playing, or at least playing their own instrument. They'll be looking at the other musicians. They'll be making eye contact with people. They'll be looking to see if that person does something to indicate something is going to happen. If you're leading a jam session with musicians that aren't particularly used to doing this, I've done this, you have two positions. There's your C chord, there's your G7 chord, and you start moving the instrument around so that the people watching can see what's happening. Even if you're not telling them the exact chord, some kind of motion that says, and change, will give people an idea of where the chord changes fall. You'll also see musicians nodding or pointing at each other or even making hand gestures. And these things can really, really help. If you're ever at a jazz jam, watch to see if the leader of the band pats their head. They're telling everyone in the band that we're going to play the head of the tune. And that's the bit after the intro when we started the tune. It's the main theme of the tune. We might have played that, we might have all taken a solo, had a lot of fun jamming the song, and we need to bring it to a close. So they go, play it from the top, just like we did at the beginning, and finish the song. You might also see hand signals like this, which means the singer, it's their turn to sing now. And that means that the singer knows they're going to sing this time round. And everyone else knows to shush a bit, back off, play simpler, let the singer be heard. You might just see people being pointed at, and that means you're going to take a solo. After they've started taking their solo, you're next. Things like that. Finally, you might even hear things called out. People will shout verse, chorus, maybe bridge or middle eight, or from the top, which is a bit like this. Let's do the whole pattern again from the very beginning. And even if it's not a deliberate sign by the person who's leading the tune, you could be watching their fingers. Because if you do get lost or if there's a chord that's just eluding you and you can't figure out what it is, look at somebody else's fingers. If you're lucky, they're playing the same instrument as you. But if you play more than one instrument, say you also play a bit of guitar, look at the guitarist and see if you recognise the chord the guitar player is playing and then see if you can play it on your instrument. Watch out for the turnarounds. The turnaround is just a little bit of the tune at the end of a pass through that gets us turned around. It gets us set up to go back to the beginning and do it again. The thing about turnarounds is that they're often very much a personal thing. Different players, arrangers, writers, performers will play the turnarounds differently. And you can do that even in a song that you know really, really well. You come to a little bit that's getting you ready to go round again and find that other musicians are not playing the turnaround that you learned, even though you know the song really well. So there's something to watch out for. When you get to the end of a pass through the song, what's going to happen? Don't assume that your turnaround is the turnaround everyone else is going to play. I can give you a perfect example of this. At the weekend, I was teaching at a residential ukulele course and one of the other tutors was going to play a song and said, why don't we play it together? I went, great. We both knew the song. I've played it before. He's played it before, but we'd never played it together, which means straight away, are we going to be in the same key? Are we playing the same version, the same feel? So we just started off and we listened to each other. But because my fellow tutor was the person that suggested the song and called it, really it was for me to follow him. Now, to begin with, everything is fine. We're playing trouble in mind. We're both playing in the same key as we normally play it in, which is G, and we start to strum it. Trouble in mind, I'm so blue, no problem. I 
won't be blue always The sun's gonna shine on my back door someday Now here, we've got to the end of that sequence There's going to be a turnaround Now what I do at that point is I get back to that G Sun's gonna shine on my back door someday I play a C7, a G, a D7 but I was alert to the fact that not everybody would play that turnaround. So I backed off and I watched and I listened and I found that the person that was leading the tune went like this. Sun's gonna shine on my back door someday. G, E7, A7, D7 and back in again. Both of those are a perfectly good turn around in a bluesy song like that. They're both great. Neither of them are right nor wrong because one of those sort of songs like that has been played by so many people and changed over time that really nobody plays a definitive version. They just play their own version. So I very quickly had to listen, look and try and pick up because I wasn't leading the song. So it's my job to follow the leader so I saw them go G to E7, and this is where pattern recognition comes in again. I saw that leap and I thought, I bet they're going to do a little anti-clockwise walk around the circle. But I still kept quiet just to make sure. And lo and behold, the E7 went to an A7, the A7 went to a D7, and that D7 takes us nicely back to G. And once we'd done it the first time, of course, Every other time, I was able to get that spot on. The other thing you'll notice at a jam session, now, it's obvious if everyone's playing different instruments, but as ukulele players, we're often in a room with lots of other ukulele players. And that is, we don't all play the same thing as each other. Now, we're quite guilty of that as ukulele players, and that's in part because the ukulele is a great accompaniment instrument. It's a great instrument for creating a rhythm for people to sing over. If you're watching a, a blues jam, there'll be a drummer and a bass player and a, maybe a keyboard player and a lead guitarist and a harmonica player. If you're watching a jazz band, there'll be all manner of horns and banjos and maybe double bass. So that, of course they're all playing different things. But all the things that they're playing fit within the chord structure. And you can do the same thing. And it can really, really help you out if you're just dipping your toe into jamming. Say we have a simple sequence like C, E7, A7, D7, G7, C. Pattern recognition, that is an anti-clockwise movement around the circle. If everyone else is going... If everybody did that, it doesn't sound great. But that aside, doesn't mean you have to do that. You could go Now the song might be going fast, but you don't have to go fast. If the strumming is too fast for you to keep up with, find a simpler rhythm. And one of the best things you can do in a lot of music is focus on playing on beats two and four. One, two, three, four, one, two. You've got less of a panic about trying to keep up with the speed and you'll make it sound great. Other musicians will hear that you're doing this nice back beat. They might even join you. They might play something else that works nice with that back beat you're doing and the whole rhythm of what we're playing will start to evolve. And that's the whole point of jamming. We react to each other. If the chords seem to be going past too quickly for you, then just try and play the first strum of each chord and then immediately start trying to find your way to the next one if you figure out what it is. So, I've got all this time to move to that next chord. Now I've got ages to find this one and ages to find this one and suddenly that's nowhere near as threatening as trying to go 
because once you play the chord, you can be moving to the next one really early, ready to hit it on the beat. And again, you'll be contributing something different to the sound of the group and making your life a little bit easier and there'll be less panic involved. Keep the groove. Rhythm is everything. A wrong note will fly past and be forgotten in a matter of seconds. But if the rhythm starts to fall to pieces, then the whole song will grind to a halt. And I'm not just talking about tempo. When I talk about groove, we're talking about how the rhythm that we're playing makes us feel. And that will you know, make the audience feel something if you're performing. If you're jamming, it will make everyone in the room, the other musicians, feel something. If the song you're playing has a particular feel, keep that feel at all costs. If you can't find your way around the chords, but you've already started playing and you don't want to sort of go, oh, I'm going to have to back out of this one, then just mute your strings and concentrate on keeping the groove that everybody else is doing. And as you're doing it, maybe look around and do some of the things we've seen before, like think, I'm going to look at other people's fingers. Oh, they're playing a C. Right, that's great. Oh, they've gone somewhere else. Never mind, I wonder what it is. Oh, they're back on the C again. Oh, do you know what? I think it's an A minor. Quieter. Yes, it is an A minor, and I can be confident. You can go quiet when you're a bit worried. You can be louder when you're confident, although not too loud. We'll talk about that in a moment. But at all times, try and keep the rhythm going. And if you just do that all the way through a song, you're still contributing to keeping that groove going. Musicians who jam together are respectful of each other, or at least they should be. And the ones that aren't frequently don't get invited to jam again. And what I mean by this is that, yes, they, they've got their ears open. They're listening to what's going on. They're not saying, well, I always play this song like this and I'm right. Therefore, I'm going to play this chord, even though everyone else is playing this chord. And it doesn't matter if it turns out you were right and they were all wrong, because you'll find that out later, after the jam has been ruined. You go with the leader of the song and the majority. So part of the etiquette of a jam is if somebody calls a song, then you're playing that song with them, not over them or instead of them, with them. So whatever they do, your job is to play with them, to support them, to make it sound better. If you play too loud, then one, you'll struggle to hear the people around you, but people around you will struggle to hear anything but you. Now, maybe if you're leading the jam and other people aren't so confident and they're just starting off, you might end up being the loudest. And I guess if you're the leader, that's fine. As long as if somebody else has a turn to do something like take a solo or sing a verse, you too back off and give them some room. It's about being sensitive to everybody in the room. A jam session isn't about you and your ego. A jam session is about making everything sound good for everybody. It's a collective effort. It's an obvious one, but the best way to learn to jam is to go and jam. If you don't go, you'll never get better at it. Now, of course, if you've just started playing, you'd be very nervous of doing that and might not feel that you're ready. So that's when you can try playing along with songs that you know from records or on the radio when you're at home. You can find something on YouTube and you can jam along with it. You could even find video of online jam sessions or join live jam sessions on, say, Zoom, and then no one can hear you. So you can make all of the mistakes in private, and you'll make a lot, and that's how you learn. So don't beat yourself up about the mistakes. But at some point, a pole vaulter has got to go from reading about pole vaulting to talking to their trainer about how pole vaulting is going to work and training. Now, at some point, they've got to grab the pole, run very, very quickly, and jam it in the ground, and hang on for dear life. And those first times they do it are not going to be record-breaking pole vault jumps. They are basically going to be hanging on for dear life and hoping to come down on the crash mat. 
and that is the best you can hope for in early jam sessions. But the more you do, the more you'll start to get into the way of thinking and the way of playing and what's expected of you. And also you'll find that musicians jamming are a friendly bunch and they know that it was like this when they started to jam. It was scary and they didn't want the pressure and, you know, it's okay at a jam session to sit out of a tune. It's okay at a jam session to just play very, very quietly and just try and hear yourself just to get the confidence up. That's all fine and you'll see lots of other people doing it. But if you don't show up, you're never going to get better at it. Don't expect to get everything right. Nobody does at a jam session. It's important to remember that a jam session is not a performance. If it were a performance, we would have got together and rehearsed and talked about it. And that's exactly the opposite of jamming. When you jam, what happens, happens. It's a little bit like going to see a piece of theatre or a piece of improv. If you went to see um, Shakespeare being performed, you'd expect the actors to have rehearsed their lines, got their cues, know exactly what's going on, be in costume at the right time. Whereas if you go and see improv, you maybe don't expect something of the quality of Shakespeare, but what you get from it is something entirely different. It's the spontaneity, it's the wit, it's how fast people can think. And a jam session is like that. It's going to be rough around the edges. There are going to be mistakes. You are gonna make a lot of them. We all do. Everyone in the room will be making mistakes. Maybe the, the old hands have got better at disguising those mistakes, but there will be mistakes. And that's fine, because what we're doing here is a different kind of experience to a performance. Finally, you're having fun. These are supposed to be fun things to do. It's not an exam. It's not a test. A jam session is fun. It might not seem like it to begin with because, you know, you'll get a massive adrenaline rush and you'll be excited but terrified and you'll beat yourself off over every single mistake that you make. But it's a bit like roller coasters. You know, they do all those things to you as well. You go on a roller coaster and yes, you get this wonderful adrenaline rush, but at the same time, you've got to stand in the queue and think to yourself, oh no, I'm not going to like it. Oh, that looks, oh, they're screaming. Oh my goodness, that person's been sick. I don't want to do this. And then you get on it and you do it. And when you get off, what do people do? They go and join the queue again and they get another ticket and they go and do it again. Because the feeling of jamming is what pulls people in. It is, it's the being in the moment, it's the adrenaline, it's the alertness. It really forces you to be hyper aware of everything around you. And it's a great way to develop as a musician. Develop your playing skills, but your sensitivity to other musicians and your ear. You'll often hear musicians laugh when they get to the end of a song. And that's, I suppose, takes the place of the applause because at a jam session, quite often, there is no audience. The musicians are the audience. So we get to the end of the song and hit that last chord, and rather than the roar of a crowd, what you instead get is laughter from the musicians. And that's really one of those things where they're kind of congratulating each other and also laughing at themselves for going, wow, just about made it to the end of the song there, and celebrating the fact that most of us, if not all of us, all got to the end at the same time and the song actually sounded really good. And it's also the fact that the adrenaline's flowing. And so we have this little outburst of, of laughter or a cheer or something at the end that makes us feel like we did something and we enjoyed the process of doing it. I really hope that now, I mean, it's 2021 now, and I talked about being away teaching uh, at a weekend retreat earlier on. And that was the first time I've been able to do that in well over a year. But now things are starting, fingers crossed, to open up again and people are able to meet more. Um, try and jam with people. But you know, even if you can't find a big group of people to jam with, see if you can find one person to jam with or an online group to jam with. And if you can't do that, then try and find some videos to play along with and if those videos are of 
people having a jam session, then you'll get a little bit more of that atmosphere. But even if it's just your favorite records, jamming along like this, making mistakes, feeling your way, starting to recognize what's going on is a really, really important thing for your development as, as a musician. I'm 50 years old. When I started learning to play a musical instrument, there was no internet. There were no MP3s. There were no mobile phones. My music was on cassette or vinyl. You could buy music books, but they were expensive. And when you bought a sheet music book, it was quite often a piano arrangement with guitar chord boxes over it. And even if you picked up your guitar and played those chord boxes, they were only a vague approximation of the song. They weren't what the guy on the record was playing. And so an important part of my generation's development in learning music, particularly if you're talking about learning folk music, rock music, country music, jazz music, the more non-formal side of music education as opposed to the classical route, we learned by learning how to play a song by lifting the needle on and off the record. And then we might go and play it somewhere, at a, maybe a, at a blues jam or even um, at the local music shop. And someone in the music shop might come over and go, you know that chord there, try this one instead. And gradually you start to pick these things up. And it seems like a really long-winded way of learning things compared to, say, just getting a YouTube video. But what I've come to realize is that long-winded way of doing it was really important. And if someone had just given it to me all on a plate right at the beginning, I probably wouldn't have bothered to have just remembered it. I would have gone, yeah, fine, and just looked at it every single time. Whereas I developed it over time whilst doing what I was doing, whilst playing, even whilst playing in bands and doing gigs. This stuff was picked up gradually and it was my musical education. So this stuff takes time. But the point is that while you're doing it, it is also the learning process. So get yourself out there and get jamming. I hope this has helped and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.